Peace be upon all of you. Uh, in the name of ISOC, the Islamic Society at the University of Sussex, we are uh, with all of the meanings of honor and uh, joy. We are actually glad to have one of our favorite guests uh, in today's lecture. Uh, our guest is uh, Abdullah al -Andrasi. He was a former Christian of Portuguese descent. He embraced Islam at a young age after a period of a study that started when he was 10 years old. He has continued to study Islam in the depth ever since. He has had a long experience of working in the Muslim community and his activities involve studying and talking extensively on Islamic revelativism, theology, philosophy, the philosophy of science, psychology, anthropology, and political philosophy. He has delivered talks on Sharia, secularism, liberalism, and mer the miracles of and the miracle of Quran throughout the UK and inter internationally. He has spoken in a community centers, university, college, and numerous appearance on a various program on TV channels, including ITV, is ITV, yeah, uh, BBC Arabic, Press TV, Islam Channel, and Ikra TV. He has also engaged in a number of debates with atheists, scholarists, and Christians on variety of topics from theology to political philosophy. In 2009, Abdullah Al-Andalusi confounded the public discussion forum, the Muslim Debate Initiative, a forum that promotes open dialogue and critical debate between thinkers, academics, and public speakers of all backgrounds. Please, uh, Brother Abdullah, come and uh, give your bit, please. I'll just raise my voice. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. As-salatu as-salamu alayhi kareem Muhammad wa ala alihi tayyibin wa sahbihi salihin. Thank you uh, for everyone who's come today. Thank you for the ISOC for inviting me and for FOSIS as well for organizing this uh, lecture. I've given uh, discussions on uh, Sharia uh, and whether it's barbaric or is it inhumane quite a lot uh, throughout the UK. And uh, I always find that in every uh, lecture I give, I always hear some new questions. And I think it's important that we should uh, always ask questions about this topic because we hear so much about this topic uh, in the, the, the media. Now, the word Sharia is a classical Arabic word. It means law. Uh, in the Quran, it could be used to refer to any country or any nation's law system. So whether it be uh, Christian or Jewish, uh, every nation was given a Sharia. Uh, it encompasses basically the legal injunctions uh, and interpretations which are from the Islamic source texts. And the Sharia is implemented on two levels. One level is on the individual sphere, uh, and another level is on the collective sphere, where Muslims act to apply Sharia upon their own societies uh, in Muslim lands. The Sharia is portrayed as barbaric in, mo in, in modern Western consciousness. All the deepest and darkest conceptions of European Christendom's past uh, from within the, the psyche of the, of, the, of the European is projected onto Islam and Muslims. And one such trope is that Islamic law is barbaric. But what do we mean by barbaric? How do we define that? What kind of images and concepts does uh, barbarism evoke? It, well, if you look at the average barbarian, if, if, there, if there is uh, any uh, these days, I suppose the uh, typical barbarian or, or that we know from history is uh, generally self-interested individual, very individualistic. When the Romans fought against barbarians in Europe, barbarians they fought as on one-on-one -on -one combats where the Romans would form formations and, and, uh, and obviously beat the barbarians because organized formations always beat one-on-one -on -one combat uh, by the barbarians they faced. Uh, barbarians may lack responsibility for their actions uh, on other human beings. Uh, they may have their society ordered based on uh, power and a survival of the fittest mentality. 
Barbarians uh, may also act without compassion or feeling, especially to outsiders. That's why, especially to outsiders. Uh, the punishments which barbarians may enact are arbitrary and can be disproportionate. And of course, barbarians may be ruled by mobs or small powerful elites. Now, no doubt, just like post-colonial uh, African countries, some Middle Eastern and Asian uh, Muslim countries with a history of colonization uh, are failed states and possess some problematic characteristics. However, since there are countries like uh, Malaysia, where there is a, support, a strong support for Sharia amongst the population, uh, but yet is a very civilized society with a, a good degree of industry, uh, it is not Islam that is the cause of some of the behaviours that the Western media disproportionately uh, focus on, but rather the cause lies in, uh, in immediate historical and political circumstances. But I will not discuss whether um, countries in the Muslim world are barbaric or not, or whether certain societies in the Muslim world are barbaric or not, or, or in Africa or barbaric or not, or in Latin America are barbaric or not. We're here to discuss whether Islamic law is uh, barbaric or not. What does Islam say? Now. When you start discussing any law system, you have to discuss the human. That is the basis of any law system. Before we can discuss what laws and, and how to address humans, like, like a doctor, before we discuss the right medicines for the treatment of a patient, we have to know what is the condition of the patient. So what is the condition of humans and human nature? Let's look at the various narratives. So in the Christian understanding, uh, humans are basically fallen uh, from grace. And so we are prone to evil, and we can only be redeemed uh, by uh, they say the, the, the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ's sacrifice. But apart from that, we are basically fallen creatures. Uh, we are prone uh, to sin in our innate nature. Uh, communists uh, believe that man is uh, basically, he is what the means that produced him both physically and socially. So the means of production... Uh, the, uh, he is matter like the rest of the universe but the means of production which produced in both the culture and uh, the, the, the physical aspects of that uh, it defines uh, his nature so, so mankind is uh, basically uh, the result or the manifestation of the means of production at any particular historical point consequently of course all culture, belief, religion and thought are merely reflections of the means of production in, in, that, in, that, in, in any particular point in history and in essence, man is a totality of all his relationships uh, with other men. So in essence, you're not an individual under communism, but rather the collective whole is, the, is, is man. And you're just one aspect, one uh, cell in the body of, of man. So um, communism, or most communist uh, sects, uh, will, will be prone towards a kind of collectivist uh, uh, view to man's nature. And of course, there is the liberal, or as I call it, political individualistic uh, view. Uh, where, whereby uh, we are all uh, individuals and that we have our uh, uh, impulses and desires and without looking at where these impulses come from, where these desires come from we have to just satisfy these, in, these impulses, satisfy these desires because satisfying these desires or impulses will make us uh, happy, so it is claimed and they say that basically some people say it's our natural right to do so, some people say um, there, are different, there are varying different discussions as to why uh, this is the case. Now, the uh, Quran's viewpoint to this, or viewpoint to that particular uh, aspect, or that particular philosophy is, uh, mentioned in the Quran, or oh, do you think that most of them hear or reason? No, they are just like cattle. No, they're even more astray. The reason is that if you uh, follow your impulses, where do you follow your reason? Where does reason come into it? Is reason just a slave to your impulses, or should your impulses be a slave to your reason? So what are you going to prioritize? But I think I'll do something, something more fundamental, something a bit more fundamental. If we believe that the purpose of human existence is uh, happiness, and it's some kind of a universal right or natural right of human beings, uh, why hasn't the universe got the memo on this? If you were on a desert island surrounded by predators, uh, would they respect your natural right to happiness and enjoy your life and so on? They, they wouldn't. Their, their, na their natural impulse will be driving them to basically eat you, possibly, or attack you. They won't res where is, your res where is their kind of this kind of natural right that you talked about, where uh, you'd have this natural right to have your um, uh, right to life or right to do, to do as you please, when you know that these predators don't really care about this? And of course, some people say, who, who believe in God, and at the same time believe in this concept, when they suffer an illness, when they suffer cancer, when they suffer uh, it, some kind of debilitating illness, maybe a mental illness and so on, they say, oh, why God, why did you uh, put this on me? 
how could a loving God do this to someone? But you made the assumption that, that your purpose in life is to, be, is to uh, achieve this perfect state of happiness. Uh, whereas we know that basically perfect state of happiness is impossible. And that a human being can feel both pleasure and pain. So there is a function to both, to both having pleasure and having pain rather than, ju than just exclusively uh, pleasure. So I don't, this philosophy can't be justified by looking at the natural world. But that, that's a different discussion. Of course, also, following your impulses and desires can be self-destructive as well. So, for example, you might, you, there might be a girl who's, who uh, constantly is in relationship with the wrong guy. And she always likes the guys that she goes with, but they're always the wrong guys for her. She keeps choosing the wrong people. She keeps being attracted by the wrong person. And some of these characteristics are incorrigible. So, as in, you can't change it. You, she knows she has a problem. Uh, she knows there's an issue. Or maybe another uh, example, uh, some guys... Uh, might find that they're always late for lessons, they always do last minute coursework for their, uh, their deadlines and things, and they know they shouldn't do that, and they know it's too risky, and they know that they're not going to do 100%, but they keep doing it, and they can't stop it. Why is that? So human beings, basically, are, uh, they can be irrational. In fact, most of the time we're irrational, not actually some of the time. And of course, what makes your impulses, or your uh, random impulses, or random desires, what makes them deserving to be followed anyway? I mean, well, what gives them the authority that they must be sacrosanct? Because uh, your characteristics are the result of maybe society, your upbringing, which is, you know, wasn't your choice, what, what parents you had, genes, or just you know, random bad experiences that may happen to you. Maybe you were attacked by a dog one day, and now you fear dogs and you hate dogs. That was a characteristic which you had no choice in, but it's created a phobia in you. I doubt anyone has chosen their phobias. You haven't chosen a lot of your characteristics you haven't chosen. So then why now this, do these characteristics must be obeyed like they're somehow God? And, that, and so on. Whereas um, we know that with uh, enough uh, therapy and things like this, you can help to change his characteristics, but change them according to what basis? Now, this is where the question lies. What is the basis? How are human beings, uh, what is the, the, the natural law for human beings? Who defines what the natural law for human beings? What should we be doing? Do we even have a purpose? If there is no God, if there is no intentionality behind the universe, then there is no purpose behind uh, a human life, affairs, and it is just arbitrary, and maybe it is just perhaps survival of the fittest, and maybe it is just the, the you know, the right, uh, might makes right, or is there something higher than that? Well, I don't believe that might makes right. In the Quran, it instructs, Humans, it says, I have not created the man or the jinn except to worship me. So God is telling mankind that the purpose of human beings is the worship, the reverence and recognition uh, of God, the creator behind all things. This purpose serves as a criterion which allows man's nature to be fully realized. Because if we know what we're meant to be doing, then we know uh, we have an objective of, of where we can aim for. Freedom in Islam means the elimination of obstacles to the full self-realization of man's purpose and man's nature. We know that uh, um, humans are prone to deterministic behavior. I think anyone who studies, anyone study psychology here? A psychology student, all right. You've probably studied quite a lot about how um, human, uh, human developmental, very, very formative years of human beings has a lot of effect on what, happened, what their experience is, how it affects their, their kind of later personality and characteristics as adults. So you've studied that, so you know that. So um, again, as I said, what, what, gives your, what gives the random chaotic experiences you might have experienced when you were young any authority over you that you now must uh, uh, fulfill your characteristics uh, just because you, you had these experiences in the past? Islam, unlike any other system, understands that the mechanism that causes humans to respond to external stimuli or instinct-driven emotion is also the mechanism that makes human will inherently weak. If human will were strong enough, then we wouldn't have problems such as smoking addiction, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, the need for self-help guides, uh, counseling, clinical hypnosis probably. Uh, we wouldn't encounter dietary problems if people overeat or people, or people undereat, or self-esteem problems or phobias or vulnerability to sexual predators, as I mentioned before. And I mean, sexual predators, not rapists, but people who basically are what you might call players, sex, those kind of sexual predators. Um, the, uh, some people suffer an inability to leave abusive relationships even though they know it's wrong for them. They know it's wrong for them. But they, somehow they can't find the will to leave those relationships. Why is that? Um, what about peer pressure as well? Surely if we were beings of pure will, then peer pressure would have no effect on us. But we find that in most cases, 
most humans will follow peer pressure. Your culture that you're following now, the fashions that most of you are following now, will have been dictated to you by peer pressure, and you followed. You went to the shops, you saw what was fashionable, and you bought it. And so, so this is, uh, and the language you speak, as well as many other aspects of what you think is, it defines who you are as an individual, uh, actually defines quite a lot of other, other people. And every item of clothing you're wearing is also being worn by thousands of other people. You know why I know this? Because it's mass produced by the thousands. So Islam understands that there's a lot of about our reality that dictates to us what we should do. And if you leave it unregulated, it can cause a lot of problems, self-destructive behavior or self-destructive um, environments. But Islam aims, Islam is merciful and it aims to moderate human conduct and create an environment where humans are helped to be moral, to be noble, and all of us to have our interests uh, fulfilled or have our inherent needs as human beings uh, fulfilled. So in the Quran, uh, God instructs mankind. He says, he will enjoin upon them that which is right and forbid upon them that which is wrong. He will make lawful for them all the good things and prohibit for them all the bad things. And he will relieve them of the burden and the fetters, like the, the chains that they used to wear. So the, 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 um, God will give in, in joined commands to do the good and he will forbid the bad and he will liberate you from your, your own bondages. And of course, um, Islam is not about making uh, a law system that's harsh or oppressive because Islam understands that humans are weak. We, we expect this. So in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa says, um, Allah would make this burden light for you, for, for man was created weak. And again, the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, said, I have been sent with an easy and practicable law. In Islam, we know that human beings are going to fall down. We know that they're going to make mistakes. We expect it. In fact, the, um, God says in the Quran that if we never sinned, he would destroy us and create a, a, a creation that would sin. And then they would ask his forgiveness and he would forgive them. So God expects us to sin. And it's part of a worship to God to actually realize your mistake. Pick, you, know, you know, what you fall down, you pick yourself back up again. Learning to pick yourself back up again is, very, is, is part of our purpose. So um, Islam doesn't, want, doesn't expect humans to be perfect. And the Sharia will not create a utopia system. It will create a human system. Also, humans have a limited uh, knowledge of the complexity of causality in, in, any, in any system of law. So for example, initially alcohol was permitted in, uh, uh, by, in, in, in a lot of human societies so that people would enjoy social get-togethers and obtain some modicum of relaxation. But now we see that alcohol leads to street violence, alcohol poisoning, addiction, domestic violence, rape and car accidents. And it costs the UK uh, £6 billion per year in policing and health uh, services. I suppose most of you, uh, a lot of you are, are students who might frequent uh, the bar or the club, you've seen a few fights, you've seen a few um, uh, couples arguing, you've seen, you've seen girls outside at the clubs crying because of, of what their drunken boyfriend might have, been, might have done. We've all seen it. We've all been there, we've all seen it. Why does it only happen in clubs or bars? Do people wait to store all their emotions up and, until they go to pubs and, uh, or bars? No, they get drunk and then things happen. It's quite interesting. We're expected to exercise our capacity to, for restraint by, by, in an environment where we imbibe a, a, a to, an intoxicant that eliminates our capacity to, for restraint. Why is that? Why is that kind of system allowed? Now, in the Quran it says, you may dislike something which is good for you, but, uh, and, you may dislike, and you may like something which is bad for you. God knows, and you know not. Now, okay, some, if some uh, atheists are here, then you might not believe in the God. But if you do believe in the God, then surely uh, God would know more about us, about our creation, than we would. And so we need some guidance, because humans are too complex for any thinker. And there are many thinkers throughout history who have tried to make a system to fit human nature, and they've tried and failed. Karl Marx, Karl Marx had all the good intention in the world. But he made a system which then became totalitarian. Initially, liberalism under the French Revolution also was a totalitarian system. It was only um, Edmund Burke, who we have to thank, who, re who thought that human experience with, uh, with, uh, and human nature, uh, you can't just apply a system from you know, 0 to 0 to 60 you know, in, in, in a second. You have to give it time. You, and he, he introduced conservatism, whereby you don't have pure liberalism, a pure totalitarian liberalism, but rather what you do is you have a system that incorporates some, a lot of the old laws, from tried and tested laws on humans, 
and to create more balanced states, not too liberal, not too conservative. That's why we have this kind of system that we have to this, to this day. Whereas in the French Revolution, of course, when they applied liberalism uh, much, much more purely at the right from the very beginning, oh, there was a reign of terror, it was actually called the you know, reign of terror, mass executions, as people who were not conforming to the system uh, were viewed as enemies of that system and they were eliminated. And there was no compassion for the humanity behind uh, that system, or the people who were being implemented, who was implemented upon. Now, uh, the Swiss philosopher, uh, Henri Frédéric Amiel, he says, liberty and equality are bad principles. The only true principle for humanity is justice, and justice to the feeble is protection and kindness. Now, justice, I, I suppose a rough and ready definition which Islam uh, um, kind of uh, advocates is uh, giving to people what they deserve. And anyone who says, ah, but no, but you see, you, you can't give people what they deserve, People are always going to be human, and humans have inalienable rights, and the right to freedom is one of these inalienable rights. Okay, all right, that's fine. So then why do you imprison your uh, prison criminals? Why do you imprison them? They're still human, right? They haven't stopped being human. But because they did something bad, oh, they no longer deserve that freedom. Oh, so it is about um, what is deserved and what is not deserved. Because if, if, it's always a, if the right is only contingent upon a, upon a person just being a human, and all humans deserve to have freedom, as in not to be restricted or incarcerated, then you can't imprison criminals, because they're still human. But you'd say, ah, oh, but that won't, that's not, that won't do a practical uh, law system, because if we don't imprison them, uh, you know, people will, will, people will do bad things. And I could also argue, but surely we, we always have you know, free will, surely with our free will, we can, always, uh, we can always act morally, but the people who built liberalism, even themselves, had to realize that human beings just didn't fit the liberal model that human beings, uh, you have to treat them as they deserve. And in some cases, you have to put criminals behind bars, according to that system anyway. That's why you have a prison system, because that, um, criminals have lost the right to their freedom because they breached freedom, or the freedom of other people. So it is about desert, as in what, what is deserved, and not actually about uh, this inalienable right to freedom. And, this, and, and Western uh, law systems follow that principle too. Now, um, Islam starts off by giving human beings a, a set of metaphysical uh, criterion, uh, uh, values basically. Va values and morals are not physical, they're not a physical criterion, they're metaphysical, they're about the physical. And the Quran says in Surah Al-Hadid, we sent our messengers with clear signs and sent them down with the book and the balance so that men may conduct themselves with justice. You see, who determines values? What is a value? What is good? What is bad? You know, it, can you scientifically you know, determine what is good and bad using microscopes or telescopes or uh, chemical reactions in a, in, a, in, a, in a beaker? You can't. Good and bad are concepts which are beyond the physical. And if you're, if you're an atheist, then you just say it just, it's just, it's just an uh, illusion in your mind, possibly. As, uh, I mean, Nietzsche was very consistent. So he, he was basically, as an atheist, he said, a lot of this, these things which you hold to be true are just illusions in your mind. It's subjective. It depends on the person. Uh, what, you, what you want to call good and bad, it's arbitrary. Whereas uh, in law systems which are based on uh, theology, which traditionally the West was, um, prior to, uh, I suppose, the, uh, the secular humanism overtaking religious humanism, uh, values were, the, were always determined by uh, the original universe, which is uh, the creator. Now, um, I'll start with the actual structure of what, how Sharia works by looking at the foundations of society. Because if there wasn't a society, then there is no need for any laws. But obviously, because we exist with other, other humans, there is a need for a law. Now, communism believes that the fundamental uh, unit of society is, is the society itself. So the society and the state is all one unit. There is no consideration for the rights of the individual is necessary because by giving society its rights, then uh, by extension, all people will have their, will have their rights uh, as human beings for food and shelter and so on and so forth. Uh, capitalism or liberalism uh, looks at the individual as the fundamental unit it's, it, and it posits this idea that before, uh, the, uh, before the society ever started, human beings were individuals and only we came into society uh, as, and then the society was formed. So human beings are fundamentally individuals and so the individual is the basic unit. Islam looks at it more rationally and Islam says that uh, in essence individuals may differ from the societies that spawn them. And at times, they may remake their own society. So an individual, a, true, a, a hero or a, a new thinker, he can truly remake society as he sees fit. He's not a product of that society. In, 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 all, in, most, in some cases, you can have truly unique individuals. This refutes communism, which believes that 
everyone's a product of their society. And there is no such thing as an individual that can really change things. And of course, some says about liberalism, it says that an individual is born into a family, not a family born into an individual. You needed two human beings to make you. You didn't just make yourself, you haven't always existed. There is no kind of pre-existential state where you were just an individual. You came in to existence in a, in a, with other human beings present and other human beings teaching you language and teaching you how to, ra to reason and rationalize and communicate. You are a, a product of other human beings bringing you into existence. You're not an individual. You never start out as an individual uh, and, at all. So Islam says that the fundamental unit of society is the family because that's how, that's where individuals come from. It's, they come from families, they don't come from other individuals. And Islam is not totalitarian in that there are many verses in the Quran and, and, and the Hadith by the Prophet Muhammad. So the Hadith is a recorded saying of the Prophet Muhammad whereby what people do in their own homes is not the responsibility of the state. The state doesn't care what you do inside your own homes. That's, within the, that's, within your, that's your family, and the state doesn't look at, at what, what is within your family. It only looks at what, what is between people in the public square. So Islam does not, care, does not care about what you do within your own homes, and there are prohibitions on spying, uh, and there are many times where uh, people who were caught doing something bad, like drinking alcohol, or um, uh, having prost entertaining prostitutes in their homes, they were not prosecuted because they were doing it in their own homes, and it was actually the people who had spied on them which had committed the crime. You're not allowed to spy on anyone. And, it's, and there is, there is uh, uh, many um, ayahs of the Quran, and of course hadith that attested that. Now, within the family, there is a structure that Islam uh, advocates. And this is not based on some fundamental inequality between uh, men and women as, as the media like to portray. It's based on functional specialism. Anyone that looks, that knows even the most rudimentary understanding of anatomy between men and women is know that we are different. So men generally are stronger, bigger, um, uh, have more testosterone, so on and so forth. Women have more attributes of, uh, associated with human reproduction. This is uncontestable. Um, this is not, it shouldn't be something which, isn't, which is now um, people are afraid to speak about. It's as we were, humans were basically, you know, specialized. There are many species on this planet which have specializations within their species. Within ants, you have queen, you have the queen, you have the, 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 the drones, you have the workers, you have the, uh, the soldier ants. They don't, they don't, there shouldn't be any kind of ant rights campaigns for maybe, you know, soldiers need, you know, should work and workers should be soldiers and drones should be the queen now and again and so on and so forth. It doesn't work like that. And so we are species like any other species on this planet and we have functional specialisms. It doesn't mean that, um, uh, that nowhere does it mean that, you know, oh yes, women are, are less worth in the eyes of God or they're less intelligent in, uh, at all. It just means that, in essence, that we are different, which is obvious to, to the naked eye. And, and this is something that Islam uh, testifies to and, and a misquoted verse of the Quran is this where it says men are the protectors and maintainers of women because Allah has made one of them ex to excel the other and because they spend to support them from their means and people say ah the Quran is saying that men, you know that uh, God has made men excel women so men are better than women and that's why men have to look after women I said no it's quite simply that men are given an advantage of physical strength and size just like the worker ants have, a, have, a, have these those mandibles that the worker, the worker ants don't. The, the soldier ants have mandibles that can attack um, enemies that threaten the nest. And the worker ants or the queen doesn't have uh, those uh, mandibles, those weapons. So naturally speaking, if there was no, none of this uh, civilized society that we, that we live in now, we were living in caveman times, uh, who would be protecting the, the, the family? Who would be defending it? Who would be hunting against possibly uh, dangerous predators? And, uh, and protecting the family from dangerous predators, it would be uh, the stronger, the stronger um, special, specialisms within the human uh, species, which would be men who are stronger uh, and uh, bigger, and so on. So these things are just basically uh, observation of the differentiation between human beings, which, uh, whether you believe in evolution or you believe in, in God, it, it is, the, the end result is the same, that we are like this. Now, the issue is one of functionality and not equality, because in Surah Al-Imran, in the Quran, God says, I do not waste the deed of any doer among you, any male or female. The one of you is as the other. So in the eyes of God, the deed of the man and the woman are equal. So men and women are equal in the eyes of God, according to Islam. 
And, and again, not a verse. Uh, and women shall have rights similar to the rights against them, according to what is equitable. But men have a degree of responsibility over them, and Allah is exalted in power and wise. So this is one about specialization and not about uh, a, a inequality because women are inferior or men are superior. In the West, freedom is, is, is considered to be a, for a woman uh, to resemble uh, what a man considers to be successful, i.e. having a high-flying career of some kind. But who says that having a career is superior than motherhood? Isn't nurturing the future generations of, of the future of mankind much more important than just keeping uh, people comfort for, uh, for a few years or a few decades. In essence, the, the man's, man's only role in, 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 the, in the human uh, uh, theatre that is, that is our humanity is just to keep uh, women and the family comfortable uh, for the, during their, their existence. And that's it. That's what, that's what men really do is that we basically have to keep our family comfortable and keep them supported and protected. And that's it. That, that's our job. That's it. And of course, and, uh, in Islam, the, the system is designed such that women don't have to worry about their upkeep or the protection of, them, of their persons uh, or their children. She's always guaranteed a helper and a guardian, and a man is not. It doesn't mean that when women can't work. The Prophet's wife, Khadija, anha, she was a, a successful businesswoman. All, it, all it's saying is that, that in, a, in a marriage, the man is expected to work and support his wife. Even if his wife is richer than him, he is expected to pay for her and make sure that she, has, she doesn't pay anything for the food that she eats and the clothes that she wears and the shelter over her head, even, even if he's poorer than her. Women are entitled to alimony and, and uh, dowry. So getting married, the woman is actually given a marriage gift and she's given alimony as well if a divorce occurs. But men are not. Um, as I said, men have to spend their wealth on women, and women do not have to spend a single penny of their wealth on men. If a husband does not fulfill the, the desires of, of his wife, if he's deficient in the physical aspects of the marriage, then the wife can divorce him and find someone else. However, if the man does not fulfill the desires of the woman, then it's encouraged for the man to, to not throw his woman out into the street, just because he, he doesn't like her. But he can, if, uh, if, if circumstances permitting, uh, he can take another wife instead if his, if his other wife um, if, if doesn't fulfill those roles. Because it's better than that than just divorcing her. Although, if she doesn't want to be in a, in a polygamous marriage, she can always be asked for divorce anyway. So there's always choice. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, he, he commanded... When someone asked him, what do you, ask, what do you command us about our wives? So, so a Muslim asked the Prophet Muhammad, what do you command us about our wives? And he said, give them food from what you have for yourself, clothe them by what you clothe yourself, and do not beat them, and do not revile them. I said, do not insult them. In the modern relationship, you can insult your wife, you can insult your girlfriend, you can say horrific words about your girlfriend and your wife, and that's considered to be normal relationship. But in Islam, the husband is not allowed to insult his wife, and he's not allowed to use bad language about her. Not allowed to do that. And of course, the, the Quran commands men concerning women, live with them on a footing of kindness and equity. If you take a dislike to them, and maybe you dislike a thing that God brings about a great deal of good. So basically, it's saying to men, don't complain about if, if there's anything that you don't like about your wife. You know, there might be something good in that. And live, in, live with her in a, on a footing of kindness, not of domination, or she must be subjugated. In, but you must live with her in a footing of kindness and equity. And of course, other aspects about women in Islam, that they, are, they have automatic honor in, in Islam, whereas a man has to earn, earn honor by being virtuous and good, but women are automatically uh, considered to be um, uh, 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 people of honor. Uh, the mothers are given three times more, are commanded to give, uh, the children are commanded to give their mothers three times more respect than they give their fathers. Because the mother is the, is the seat, is the heart of the family. They are not viewed as sexual objects, but they are viewed as people. So people say, oh, why do you cover, why do you cover your women? 
why do you cover, you know, why are they told to, you know, cover up their, their you know, sexual attributes? I say, why, do you want to look at women as a sexual attributes? Do you want to look at them as sexual objects? Is that how you want to define them? Is that the only way women, women can get noticed, is by showing a bit of cleavage or showing a bit of their, themselves? And of course, just calling it, I'm just expressing my individuality. So, um, showing, uh, you know, your chest and body shape, which all women have, is expressing your individuality, right. That's not in, nothing, nothing individual about that if every other woman has it. It's like I'm saying, I'm going to show my two eyes because I'm expressing my individuality. Every other human being, most humans have two eyes, or two ears or a nose. So where is that expressing your individuality? Of course, um, anyone who studies the history of advertising will know that that was started up 100 years ago where they, to try to get women to become consumers and buy you know, more clothes, adverts started coming up saying that, you know, buying new clothes was expressing your individuality. And then we kind of bought into that. And now we have the fashion industry as we know it today. In Islam, women are allowed to choose who they get married to. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was going to dissolve a marriage of a woman who, was, who her father made her marry a guy, a guy against her will, and the Prophet Muhammad was, was willing to dissolve that marriage. And uh, she, didn't, she said no because she just wanted to test the system. She actually liked the guy, but, the fact, but on principle, she wanted to demonstrate that fathers couldn't make their daughters marry uh, whoever against their will. So the Prophet Muhammad was going to grant her wish, but she actually liked the guy in the end. But it was, she did it on principle. And of course, women are not socially compelled to mutilate themselves, to fit into inhuman definitions of beauty, like, being, like size zero, or, or uh, uh, size zero bodies, or breast implants, injections of collagen into the lips, hair products, body waxing, high heels, uh, two hours to do their hair sometimes, uh, anorexia, how much hair do you have? Anyway, uh, anorexia, bulimia, and you know, um, have suffering burns from hair straighteners. All these you know, very horrific things women do to themselves just to be acceptable in society. Why do they feel the need to do all these things to themselves just to be accepted and respected as human beings in society? There's something very uh, uh, strange about society that, that demands that. They're not socially compelled to emphasize their sexuality to obtain leverage in society. I would view that as a, as a barbaric criteria. And of course, Islam encourages, and as many sources in the Quran, when men and women to cooperate for good works, like business, education, intellectual research, affairs of state, or war, and the like. So there was a case where a, a, a woman approached Prophet Muhammad Islam, to join the Muslim army. She didn't have to, men were expected to fight. Uh, uh, it's mandatory for men, but women were, uh, were asking the Prophet Muhammad to join Muslim armies uh, to fight for justice, and they were allowed to. And I think if you truly want to judge a society in how it regards human life, then you should see how it treats the source of human life, women. And then you'll see whether a society truly dignifies human life or not. Now, how does Islam build community? That was a family. How does Islam build community? Well, Islam has many aspects which encourage uh, good, good morals, good neighborliness. We, all, we see that basically Islam encourages um, Muslims to smile at other people. Just even if, that, if you can't do much, at least smile at other people. Some Muslims look very dour-faced, but you should smile more. And of course, uh, you're not allowed to ridicule or insult, which is where um, people have always misunderstood uh, what Islam believes about freedom of speech. Islam believes that you can't insult uh, other people and make a, a ridicule them because it hurts. If you believe that human beings should be happy, then why insult them? I mean, insult is not that you say something and that offends someone else. No, no. Insult is you intend to ridicule and debase and you're not a human being, calling them silly names or calling them or, or debasing their identity by insulting their beliefs or their religion, whether it's atheism, whether it's it's, uh, it, it, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Islam, whatever the case might be, insult adds no benefit to society. There, you, you can't say, well, insult helps the pursuit of truth. No, it doesn't. Intellectual debate helps the pursuit of truth, yes. Research helps the pursuit of truth, yes. Insult has never helped the pursuit of truth. So there is no justification for why that should be allowed under freedom of speech. But as, as Muslims, we believe that you can't insult anyone, even those people whose beliefs we um, strongly disagree with. Uh, intoxicants are forbidden for obvious reasons. They're one of those antisocial things. They're, they're meant to be social, but they cause a lot of uh, antisocial problems, which I already mentioned. And of course, there are aspects of the Sharia which uh, people find controversial, but they don't understand the reason for them. And these aspects of the Sharia are, are for example, Islam prevents 
non-essential uh, contact between men and women. And there's a reason for this. It's not because just, just to be oppressive or we're going to start oppressing people because we like it. No. Sure, men and women can work together, they can do research together, they can study together, they can you know, teach together and so on and so forth. They can do all these professional things together. But hanging around in social situations, how many of us have known of our, either ourselves or friends of friends or friends of friends of friends who basically they were just friends with a guy or friends with a girl uh, maybe they had a girlfriend as well and then one day they were just home watching a movie with their friend and something happened and of course they always use the, they always explain it and said it just happened they always say that oh it just happened oh like you know you were hit by lightning and it just you know one of those random things that just happens you know you're just walking by and you, you know suddenly you end up in someone's bed you know it just happens no I'll tell you what happens it's sexual tension, it's desire, it's impulse. This is, these are obvious things. We know these things. You might, have, you might have guys who pretend to be your friends to the girls out here. You might have guys who pretend to be your friends. But really, there's a lot of sexual tension between you guys. There's a funny video I saw on YouTube. And what they did was uh, they, uh, they went around a university campus. I think it was in America. And they asked uh, a whole bunch of women. I said, like, you know, do you have any guy friends? And they said, yes, yes, we do have guy friends. Oh, you know. Uh, are you intimately involved with them? No, no, they're just my friends, you know, like, you know, do you think they like you? No, no, we're just, you know, we're just, uh, we're, we're just friends and so on. And of course, they ask the same question to, to the guys. And they say, yeah, I do like her, and I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to get her somewhere. They, you know, and, and what was even what was funnier was when they pushed the women as to, come on, do you really, come on, sure, surely you must know deep down if they like you or not. I say, well, actually, okay, I think some, some of them do like me. Oh, well, you keep them around. Why you keep them around for? If you think, you know, if, they like, if you know they like you and so on and so forth, oh, maybe it's because they like the attention. Maybe because it helps their self-esteem when you know there's guys that like you. Uh, just, just not, not, not going to do anything with them. Just guys that like you, which around, makes you feel good about yourself. Who knows? These are the kind of sexual politics which, which occur, frustration, and it leads to infidelity. I mean, it leads to, I mean, I'll give you another example. People who believe this, people who say, no, no, men and women can control themselves. There is, you know, we're not all, we're not all just jumping on each other's beds. That's true, most people won't, obviously. However, wouldn't, um, most girls will feel uncomfortable if they heard their husband or boyfriend just had a night in watching, watching a movie with their, one of their friends who's a girl as well. And they, and they weren't there. They'd feel uncomfortable. Why would you feel uncomfortable for? Isn't it just friends? Isn't it just, we're all adults, right? It's funny, we're all adults, but yeah, adults are the ones who commit infidelity and cheat and, and, and play and, and so on and so forth. So this is, these are just basically observations of human nature. As simple as that, we all know it, uh, but we, but kind of it, to be PC, we don't admit it, we don't admit to it, but this is uh, what is human nature and Islam recognizes this. So all Islam says is like, eliminate the temptation. Look, if you, you can work with women for every you know, professional capacity you can imagine, that's fine. But do you really need to have uh, you know, a relationship with them outside of marriage? Is that really compulsory? Will, you know, will that add any, any, any intellectual social benefit to your world when there are clear possible disadvantages? That's all Islam is saying. It's an observation of human nature. Now on to something on the economics, and this is a, a very interesting aspect of Islam. Uh, we know that, uh, I won't discuss communism so much because that's pretty much, um, no one's gonna be really going to advocate that. But in capitalism, there's a fundamental theory. Anyone, believe, uh, anyone uh, study economics here? Or uh, you? Okay. The fundamental problem, uh, economic problem, is uh, obviously, they say, there's finite resources and infinite human needs. So infinite human needs. But do humans have infinite needs? How much food do we need to eat? How much uh, shelter do we need? How much clothes do we need? Okay, I'm not going to talk about Paris Hilton. She probably has infinite needs. When that, but how much clothes do we need? How much, these are basic necessities of human survival. You don't need an infinite amount. Of course, if you say that all you know, yeah, human need, uh, needs are infinite, then the strongest, and you let, that society, you let people just basically fight over these resources, the strongest or those who have uh, more capital, and they're starting capital at least, will get most of those resources, creating huge wealth uh, disparities where you have su such a situation, I mean, the, the statistics vary, but 10% uh, you know, of the world owns 80% of the world's resources. Is that, is that really fair? 
on human beings. Of course, some, there are different, there are other statistics which are, but I use a more kind of uh, conservative estimate. There are actually worse uh, uh, statistics. What Islam says is that human beings have fundamental needs, which are, should be guaranteed. Survival, food, clothing, shelter, energy. There's also an, an, an additional, which is reproductive partner, healthcare and education. Those things, the Islamic economic system does not allow the free market uh, to uh, take off and deprive of anybody. However, there are luxuries. So big plasma screen TVs, nice cars, uh, you know, nice computers and mobile phones, these are luxuries. And in this aspect, Islam is free market, it's laissez-faire. And uh, it's basically, the, we see um, the Prophet Muhammad so someone saying that the son of Adam, which means humanity, has no better right than a house wherein he should live, a, a piece of clothing where he may hide his nakedness, and a piece of bread and some water. And in another narration by the Prophet Muhammad, free things are not prevented from the people. Uh, the water, which is basically natural resources, uh, the pastures, uh, land, and fire, which is um, energy. So we see uh, that uh, the Quran um, then prohibits things like interest. And in the Quran it says, God has permitted trade and forbidden interest. So trade is, you can trade as much as you want, that's fine. But interest is an uh, economic evil. Because what's really happening, if you think about it, there's, a, there's the rich uh, capital owners, and then there's the poor who uh, need the capital. So the rich uh, lend money to the poor, and they have to pay it back with a bit extra. Where, where, where is the net direction of money traveling from? The net direction. It's from the poor to the rich. So because when, when they get their money, when they get their loans paid back, it's more money than when they initially gave out in the first place. So the poor generally become poorer and the rich become richer. And that is what's caused a lot of disparity. Islam has also prohibited gambling as well. As we all, uh, gambling also causes uh, the same kind of disparity in economics and, 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 it, and it preys upon the poor. Uh, most of the poor uh, who, uh, you know, where you'll see these gambling shops in poor areas is a reason for this. So basically, uh, Islam has prohibited this. And an economist called Jenny Lund has said, since relig religions have a vision of creating a better world that is not centered upon economic factors, their values and moral codes provide a stronger foundation for a more sustainable and appropriate development strategy. The capitalist system promotes a survival of the fittest approach to managing human resources. This leads to concentration of wealth, economic exploitation of weak countries, poverty, famine, hyperinflation, third world debt, and modern day debt slavery. Um, where you have these debt slaves which make goods for rich countries for a pittance, whereas Islam tries to focus on wealth distribution and mutual benefit in any economic transactions. So we see that from Islamic history, the, his the, the history of the caliphates and things like this, you had wonderful trade, uh, uh, trade empires between uh, countries and nations. There were nations who had economic uh, relations with the Muslims and were so impressed with the economic relations with Muslim lands that they wholesale converted to Islam with, with no uh, invasions, no jihad, no nothing. Like Indonesia and Malaysia, now the most populous Muslim countries in, in, in the Muslim world, converted purely on their economic contact with the Muslims, with Muslim lands, the caliphates and things like this. The Western uh, system of capitalism at one, in its history has reintrodu reintroduced slavery from, from Roman times and then they, they got rid of it when, uh, quite conveniently when industrialization provided a quicker and faster alternative. Uh, whereas what Islam did was, Islam didn't really introduce slavery, what it did is there was already the practice of slavery at the time of Islam, Islam regulated that and raised dignity and gave rights to slaves and then had a policy of phasing out slavery by making, um, firstly by preventing anyone from acquiring new slaves and by making many good deeds or if you, uh, you know, in, in freeing slaves or as an expiation of sins. If, you, if you've done a sin, you can pay for that sin by um, freeing a slave. So there was many such verses uh, and so on. And of course, as in terms of rights, let me I'll just give, give you a quote you one hadith on this issue. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, about slaves, so he told Muslims who might have slaves, they are your brothers whom God has placed under your authority. Therefore feed them with what you eat and give them to wear what you wear and do not overburden them and if you charge them with such chores, help them. And in some cases, uh, well, uh, sorry, in, in, uh, in, in some cases if a person basically, well in all cases, if a person hits his slave, the slave is automatically released. Free. If you abuse, you physically abuse your slave, he's automatically freed under Islamic Sharia. 
Uh, not only this, but you're not even allowed to refer to your slave as slave, nor he can call you master. You must call him like, he's my son. So when you have a family, you'd call him my son or my brother, and he'd call you um, either uh, you know, father or even Sayyidi, which is a term of respect in, in Islam. It's not master. Now, this is how Islam dealt with these, these issues, and, and it aimed to phase it out. Unfortunately, throughout Islamic history, um, some Muslims tried to, unscrupulous Muslims, tried to find a loophole in that by trying to go to other countries, uh, make, get, get slaves from countries outside of the Muslim lands, bring them in, and then, then just claim that, oh, they were already slaves. You know, they were already slaves. We just imported them in. And that was uh, in, un unscrupulous and against the Sharia law, and they had the reckoning on their judgment with God. Now for the, the punishment system in Islam, which is uh, arguably the most <laughs> contentious aspect of it in, in, uh, in the media. I'll only be five more minutes on this issue. The uh, punishments in Islam are designed to be instant. We don't believe in depriving any criminal um, of his family or a family of uh, one of their members of, the, of their family. So they're designed to be instant uh, for punishments lesser than capital ones. We don't believe that you should put human beings into glorified human zoos known as prisons, uh, where they, they act in a debased manner. Of course they're going to be acting in a debased manner. You should, you've locked them in a cage with other, with other inmates and they're stuck there. So what are they going to do? They're going to basically fight each other, they're going to do even more horrific things to each other. And this is a, a very horrible thing. Um, John Stuart Mill, the liberal philosopher, he himself was against the abolition of death penalty. He said, that it was worse than life imprisonment. Uh, so it was, it was worse to, uh, to have the, um, life imprisonment than death penalty. Because at least with death penalty, the suffering of the criminal, the murderer, for example, is over and just has been done to society. But if you lock that person up for the rest of his life, you basically um, are torturing him for the rest of his life in jail for a large number of years. So Islam does believe in capital punishment because it's actually more humane than locking someone up in a human zoo for most or all, all, all the rest of their life. In terms of the um, punishment for theft, which people uh, like to put, like, which is basically the uh, amputation of the hand. People say, oh, that's really barbaric, that's horrific, how could you, how dare you? Well, let's look at it in context. Fine. It would be barbaric if there were no conditions. But there are conditions. And those conditions are that if someone stole because they're poor, you can't punish them at all. If they were poor and they stole, there is no punishment. Again, uh, we know that Caliph Omar during a time of famine, he actually suspended the punishment for theft during a time of famine. Uh, and so, and then many other, many other cases. You, you, you have to basically steal, uh, if you steal from your family, you're not punished. You have to steal from a secure location. So not if I just you know, grabbed your, your, your purse off you in daylight and ran off that's not actually punished with that punishment. And I have to steal it by stealth. And there's basically, there's basically seven, uh, uh, seven uh, criterions, which in essence, the only person that really will get punished for, for this crime is um, that, that, was it Catwoman from uh, the recent Batman film? <laughs> yeah, um, someone like her would probably be punished uh, for, on, on that crime. And the reason why it's amputation of the hand is not because it's meant to be gruesome or painful or so on, no. It's because what do they steal with? They steal with their hand. So if you live in a system which is not materialistic, whereby your status is not measured by how much wealth you have, and that all your basic human needs are taken care of, and, and you know, okay, if you're a Muslim, uh, then you, 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 know, you have a fear of God, and you have a fear of, of, uh, heaven and he of, uh, of hell, and you, want, you desire heaven, and you still steal, and you're not insane, obviously if you're insane, you're not punished at all, but if you're not insane, and you still do that, then you're a threat to the economic system. There's something wrong with you, you're a threat to the economic system. And so to protect the right of property of other people from habitual thieves or people that go out of their way to steal, which is what you'd have to do to fulfill that law, then they, they, the means of stealing is, is deny that person, which is basically your hand. As for, the, uh, as for murder, murder is obviously punishment, uh, punishable by um, capital punishment. However, would you believe a Sharia has a policy of forgiveness? It, it can let off murderers if the family of the victim forgives the person. <coughs> forgiveness. In this society, you murder, no one's going to forgive you. You can't be forgiven in this society. You commit murder, you're going to get punished in some way. In, in America, you'll be executed in some states. But in the Sharia, you can be forgiven. You have to pay blood money for compensation to the family. But you can be forgiven. Forgiveness. Can there be something called forgiveness in a barbaric system? 
Um, also, uh, I didn't mention this, for theft as well you can be forgiven. So the person you stole from uh, can also forgive you as well and uh, you'll be, you can be let off. The other, the other punishments and the most controversial ones are the punishments for uh, fornication. And, for, and that's only designed for the protection of the family. If you make uh, the, the purpose of family or the purpose of marriage is an enlightened concept where human beings can reproduce and the kids can be protected, they can have a mother and father and they can basically have a respectable and stable environment. But if you basically have situations where people can fornicate uh, and not have any responsibility for their fellow human beings, so a guy plays a girl, uses her, uh, or, or, or a girl plays a guy, uses him, and then they, they run off, you know, this, and maybe this, maybe one of them, you know, maybe the, obviously the woman's going to be pregnant, the guy, but one of them's pregnant, uh, you know, that's not, that's not a civilized way to act in, in, in society. But that only occurs when there's no protection uh, for the family. And as uh, Mr. Justice Coleridge, who's a family court judge in the UK, as he said, almost all of society's ills can be traced directly to the collapse of family life. We all know it. Examine the background of almost every child in the care system or the youth justice system and you'll discover a broken family. So by restricting uh, human reproduction to a, to an environment of responsibility, it creates a, sta uh, you know, it creates a, a, a understanding or a system whereby people uh, will have, uh, will basically will have stable relationships where kids will have fathers and will have mothers and basically there won't be this uh, feeling of abandonment or why did my father abandon me? Why did my mother abandon me? Uh, and many such problems which have caused a lot of delinquency in the youth today, unfortunately. And also the punishment for adultery. Now the punishment for adultery, on the, when you first hear it, it sounds quite as extreme, which is basically uh, you know, uh, being stoned to death. And, there's, and it, would sound, it would be barbaric. Again, if there wasn't conditions. And these conditions make it practically impossible to apply the law. Basically, you need four witnesses Four witnesses to witness you committing adultery with uh, you know, either your guy and you're doing another girl or a girl and another guy. You need four witnesses who have exactly the same story. And if, if anyone accuses you or the woman, uh, well, mostly the woman basically, of committing adultery and they, they don't have the requisite evidence or their, their testimonies don't match up with those four witnesses, then the, the guys who came up and, and, and claimed that this was happening, they get punished for false accusation uh, or slander of the woman. Again, women, women's honor is automatically protected in Islam. You can't accuse a woman of committing adultery without evidence otherwise you'll get punished within the Islamic system. That's how much we protect women and their, uh, their, their uh, rights. Now, I think you, you'll probably realize it now, it's virtually impossible. It's virtually impossible to, to, to you know, unless you want to commit adultery in the middle of a football stadium in a half time <laughs> as an alternative to the usual uh, 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 festivities. Um, make a very interesting game, but, um, but you're not going to get caught, really, isn't it? This is, it's not even designed to get caught. People came up to Prophet Muhammad and said, I commit adultery, punch me. He actually he, he turned his head away, didn't want, didn't want to hear it. Like, don't, don't admit to it, he didn't want to hear it. And people, the only reason we kind of know that people actually were executed for adultery is they actually admitted to it and asked to be punished for it. Because you virtually just can't, um, you can't uh, you know, uh, prove in a court of law practically with four people who witnessed the act. It's practically impossible. And what I mean by it, it's not just where the four, these four people will see a man and woman naked next to each other. You have to see everything, like literally, like with, 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 uh, with no doubt at, to, at whatsoever. And the Prophet Muhammad said that eliminate the hudud, eliminate these capital punishments with doubt. So he said, if you can find any way not to apply this capital punishment, then find it. It's, the Prophet Muhammad didn't want to apply this system. He's not wanted applying it. The deterrent effect is more that it exists. The law exists. That's all. It, that's all it's, it's there to do. If you commit a crime of adultery, it's better that you seek forgiveness from God. But uh, and if you, whatever you do in the privacy of your own home is within your own home. As I said before, Sharia doesn't care what you do in your own home. It's between you and God. Sharia, Sharia can't make you a good believer. It's here to make the environment around you conducive to being a good believer. That's the purpose of Sharia. And of course, the reason why it's stoning to death is more, uh, if you look at basically how, you see, you see the Palestine-Israel uh, Palestine conflict, you see how when they're facing Israeli tanks, people throw stones. Within Arabic culture, 
Uh, the way to signify that the society rejects something or you reject something is you throw stones at it. So when you people go to Hajj, they throw stones at a pillar, which is meant to be symbolic of the devil, showing that, that we reject the devil. So all that, all the, the stoning to death is more that the society, when they, if these adulterers come out in public and they really have to come out in public in a brazen way to get to get fulfill this law, uh, but they come out in public, then society has to symbolically show that we reject this act, we reject this attack on the, 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 the sanctity of the family and the sanctity of marriage. But as, as I said, uh, according to Ottoman court records, which are Ottoman caliphate for, which was a 600-year-old caliphate, um, there was only, within, 400, within the last 400 years, there was only one punishment for adultery in 400 years. So literally, the British state, within the same time, has killed more people uh, 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 in, in its legal system uh, than the Ottomans did for the issue of adultery. Um, I'll finish up with just talking about how non-Muslims are treated under Sharia. I think that's also a very big uh, contentious issue. Um, oh yes, actually before I move on to that, um, one issue is the, con the issue of homosexuals. And say, what does Islam, how does Islam treat homosexuals or what, how does Islam treat homosexuals? And quite simply, Islam doesn't discriminate homosexuals because we don't discriminate against homosexuals. What I mean by that is we don't categorize human beings by their sexual proclivities. What kind of system would categorize human beings by their sexual taste? It's like me saying there are the pro-Marmite people and the people that are anti-Marmite people and they each have their rights, they have their own special rights. It's a taste, it's your, your preference, your sexual preference. It doesn't define you as a human, it's not you, you're, you're now a different kind of human now because you have one preference, not a preference. You're not now an alien or something because you have a preference X, Y, and Z. If some doesn't look at human beings in that sense, if some doesn't see heterosexuals and homosexuals, that was a very recent invention. It wasn't, inve it wasn't in, the, in, the old, in the ancient world. They didn't, have that discrimin they didn't discriminate like that. They didn't look at, look at the world like this. It was within the last 120 years, I think, when they, when they, in Victorian times, when they started to come up with the idea of homosexual and heterosexual. Uh, Islam doesn't have this concept. It doesn't view human beings like that. It just views humans as humans. And again, uh, it only p publishes public fornication. So what you do in public, I mean you have to go right in public and do it, uh, which I believe is called dogging in this society. <laughs> uh, but uh, whatever you do in your own home is between you and God. It, yes, it is a sin. It is a sin because it's against, uh, Islam believes it's against natural law for human beings uh, for our, our to, to procreate uh, within, within the same gender. However, it is between you and God. And it's a sin between you and God that you can have to deal with between you and God. The Sharia does not, um, will not hunt you into your homes and see what you're doing in your homes, whether you're living with a guy or not. Or, or not. And people might say, but what about you know, guys going on the streets and holding hands and kissing? You know, would Sharia punish them? Well, my answer to that is just go to the Arabic world and you'll see that <laughs> that's Arabic culture. <laughs> so Arab, Arabs already do that. Guys hold hands and they kiss. Maybe not French kissing, but they kiss. Uh, and in some cases, actually kiss each other on the lips, but I, I don't know. Uh, hopefully, no, no, there's no tongues used there, I don't think. I, uh, I can only speculate. Anyway, now, uh, how does Islam deal with non-Muslims? And I'll end my lecture on this. Islam believes in a multicultural system. In fact, a true multicultural system. The Quran says there is no compulsion in a religion or belief. For truth is clear in falsehood. In Islam, we are so confident that the truth is clear from falsehood, we don't need to compel anyone to be Muslim or force them or create an environment where they're discriminated against so that they will be forced uh, to be uh, Muslim. But Islam looks at it that, okay, a state has to be based on some values. The values of the state, of an Islamic state, will be Islam. However, although the relationship of the Islamic state with the Muslim is one based on religion, so the Muslim is religiously compelled uh, to uh, be part of the state and to help the state and so on and so forth. But non-Muslims or Christians and Jews and others who don't believe in the, in the value system of that state, the state is basically, for all intents and purposes, secular with you. So, uh, and this, uh, it will form a contract with non-Muslims called con contract citizenship. Anyone who studied Rousseauian uh, political thought will know about contract citizenship. Uh, and this is called dhimma, or dhimmi, uh, and the person is called a dhimmi in Islam, so dhimma. In England, which is secular, you are all dhimmis of the state. Because, and in America, you are all dhimmis of the state. You basically pay a tax to the state, and the state protects you and your rights. That's the contract between you and the state. That's what that's contracts is. This is what it means in the Arabic dhimmi. Uh, some Islamophobes like to, mean, like to portray it to be some kind of 
uh, you're subjugated or you're a second class citizen. No, uh, it means contract citizen. Simple as that. It's a secular relationship. That's all it is. You are all vimis of, the, of Western governments uh, currently. Um, both Muslims and non-Muslims have to pay tax. But whereas Muslims have to pay a zakat tax, which is 2.5% of their wealth, uh, on top of taxes the state might levy against Muslims to, uh, for obligations such as uh, uh, industrialization or fighting against uh, oppressive regimes and so on and so forth, uh, non-Muslims only have to pay a tax called jizya, which is an exemption from military duty. What it means is that in the Islamic State, one of the religious obligations of the Muslim is to basically fight in the armies of a Islamic State against oppressors, oppressors or so on and so forth. So if a randa was happening, we'd be straight in there protecting the Tutsis. And all Muslims, Muslim, Muslim males, or, or sufficient Muslim males, must be inducted into, into the army and be um, put, on, the, put to, on, this, on that campaign. But non-Muslim males uh, are not expected uh, to, uh, uh, to join armies and fight in, in battles. They can if they want to, and if they do, they're exempt, then they're exempted from the jizya tax. Then you don't have to pay uh, any tax at all because you're actually um, putting your life on the line. But if you, but, uh, if you pay the jizya, there is exemption from military duties that Muslims, uh, Muslims don't, don't have that luxury. And uh, of course, um, this, the non-Muslims are allowed their own legal systems uh, within um, semi-autonomous areas. So Jews had Jewish law, Christians had Christian law, they had their own judges, their own courts, they had their own enforcers of their own laws. And you had like cities, in, like in Syria, for example, in Damascus, there's still what was called an, a Jewish quarter. And that's called just for Jews uh, and to, to reside in, they had their own autonomy and they had their own law system. And generally what happened was that um, the different corners of the city became known as certain industries. So, you know, Jews were very good at metalworking, so they, they, they became known as that. So if you wanted to, um, some good quality metalworking, you'd go to Jewish quarter and you'd commission some work out in medieval times and things like that in Damascus. And so this is what will happen. And this is a very interesting multicultural system because it doesn't mean that you have to assimilate or integrate into, the, into, the, into the, an Islamic state. You can be exactly who you are. You'll be recognized for who you are. You'll be accepted for who you are. And you won't be compelled to follow a culture or follow this or follow that. Whereas in secular systems, I think as you, as you realize that they, 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 they now are declaring that multiculturalism has failed. Islam had multi, successful multiculturalism for 1,300 years, but in the West they couldn't manage uh, you know, even 50 years. So this is um, one of the, at least in, at least in, in European countries. Uh, and as I said, we, we all know that how the Jews were treated initially, but in, in Europe and in America, a lot of anti-Semitism, a lot of pogroms against uh, Jews, even within the last hundred years, even before Hitler, there was a lot of anti-Semitism, a lot of violence against, uh, against Jews uh, for being different and not assimilating, not integrating and so on and so forth. Whereas in, in Islam, uh, we don't have the history where we forced the Jews, or we did pogroms against the Jews. We don't have that at all whatsoever. And of course, uh, uh, there is interfaith courtesy, whereby, uh, as the Quran says, do not curse the idols besides God. So don't, don't curse the idols of polytheists, uh, lest they blaspheme and curse God out of their ignorance. It's basically saying that the, 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 that the, w the worst concept for a Muslim who's a pu who, are, who are pure monotheists is polytheism. It's, it's the most abhorrent concept to ourselves. But the Quran is saying, do not insult their gods. You're not allowed to insult their gods. You know, lest in their ignorance, you know, they insult your god. You wouldn't like it if they insult your god. So don't insult their gods. I mean, the Quran is full of critique against polytheism. Yes, intellectual critique. But it never insults or ridicules other people's beliefs. And that's how different people of different religions can coexist in a society harmoniously. When you don't insult. There was loads of debates. There was public debates. There was Christians... Uh, uh, criticizing something, there was missionary activity in medieval Baghdad, 9th and 10th century. You see Muslim uh, uh, scholars complaining about missionary tactics. I mean, they, they weren't saying, kill these missionaries, how dare they preach Christianity in, in, Islamic, in Islamic land. No, they were saying, oh, I don't like how these missionaries go around and they just have their tactics and this and that and this. And they were just mo having a moan about it, which, you know, some of us have moaned about it today. But, they, these, but it shows that missionaries, Christian missionaries, were free to go around being, doing their missionary work in Islamic lands medieval Islamic lands, Baghdad, 9th and 10th centuries. And I mean, that was just one example. Uh, they, were, they, they did it consistently throughout. So these are the kind of, in a nutshell, this is what the Sharia is. The Sharia is aimed um, to 
provide an understanding. It understands human nature and, and, and purpose, and it tries to encourage and discipline uh, the, 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 uh, us according to this purpose, and, and so that we're not selfish, or we have a self-centered worldview. It provides foundations of society based upon responsibility and nurturing family structures. It provides an economic system based on morality and not materialism. And I can go into detail about the economic system, but I had to keep it brief because I'm already uh, one hour uh, in, into my lecture. Uh, it has a multiculturalism that promotes coexistence and acceptance and not integration and assimilation. Its penal system is designed to prevent an, an, an anarchic, anarchic uh, uh, um, practice or behavior by citizens, prevent barbarism. Uh, that is its aim. And it also is compassionate in practice. So there is forgiveness in, the, sh in the, the Sharia law system, whereas you don't get forgiveness in any secular law system at all. And, and of course, you know, Islam tries to address human nature. The whole point is it tries to address human nature to bring about full human realization without e we are stepping on each other's toes. That is basically, in a nutshell, what it is. Islam is not barbaric, but it is just, it is compassionate, and it, and it is uh, equitable, and it is the very definition of civilized. And Islam urges human ennoblement, enlightened conduct, and altruism. Islam's penal system is suitably severe to restrict the inner barbarian in us all, but, uh, and it, but it's, it tries to be compassionate and understand human weakness and failure at the same time, and that's why it allows forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Abdullah. It was really great. I think you uh, actually succeeded to heated uh, heated us too much. Uh, I can see from the people faces uh, too much questions. And uh, as you see, as you see here, we have we the, we have two uh, actually uh, question marks. If you do a qu uh, question the our guest uh, good and uh, perfectly, uh, we will give you a, a good pizza, inshallah. In the, in the end of the lecture. So please, we ha you have now more than half an hour. Uh, it's open uh, time for your questions and your comments. And uh, after that, there's the dinner, inshallah. Questions or criticisms? There must be loads. Yeah. Uh, the lady over there? Um, okay, you did mention homosexuality. Um, uh, what, sorry? You mentioned homosexuality. Yes. Um, but what I felt was that everything was geared to me really as well. I, I had that many issues the whole. I understand, you know, that's fine, that's my problem, but I still agree, you know, like, I accept it and, you know, that's where all it is. But I still felt, like, like I've heard from the population, and part of being homosexuality is it can happen in any kind of case. Because surely, the, some people found the same sex, people don't, you're still going to have the same issues and problems with the whole thing. And if someone's holding hands in public, you know, why can't, um, all the people are kind of geared towards male and female. Not only, not only makes themselves be male and female. Everything fits into those unique kind of criteria, basically. So when you, I'm trying to ask, like, basically, it's only put it in the criteria that don't really fit um, male and female. There's a gay, there's a gay, you know, when we do this, we won't do that. But what if you're home, what if, what if it's the same sex relationship, and what if you don't fit into those categories? Okay. Well, generally speaking, um, unless someone is a hermaphrodite, uh, generally speaking, they, you're either male or female. And those are categories which, are, which I'm sure the, the homosexual community. Uh, w w I mean, I, I disagree with using the term homosexual community. I just, I just see them. As, I just see people as humans. But in the West, we call them homosexual community. Uh, they fit of female and male. They're composed of female and male. What I'm saying is that um, the marriage, the purpose of, of marriage, the purpose of, uh, in, in human natural law, if you believe in natural law for human beings, is reproduction. That's the whole purpose. It's the, the institution of it is to manage reproduction. Um, so it concerns, you know, male and female who can basically produce together a, a child, and that's where that's where it comes from. In terms of uh, you know two guys living together in the same house or holding hands, uh, what uh, what kind of special issues do they require? Because um, it's not a reproductive relationship. They live together. They can do bequests. So if one of them dies, they can say, "My will, give this, give my stuff to this guy or whatever." It can be, that can be done, um, you know, it can be done between friends and so on, but the Sharia law is not concerning what people do in their own homes. Uh, the legal law the system is not concerned what people do, whether it's a sin or not a sin. All that the Sharia looks at is protecting uh, human reproduction and creating a safe environment for kids, for children and the stability of family uh, within a reproductive uh, family. That's all, it's, that's all it's, it's concerned with. Regarding relationships between uh, human beings, general etiquettes of not insulting, not oppressing, not hurting, not, not murdering, not abusing, these things will come into to, to play to prevent humans from abusing each other.
Well, it's better. I mean, now you've been discriminatory against, um, you know, heterosexual fa heterosexual relationships. Sorry. As I said, it, look, Islam doesn't look. I said Islam doesn't look at human beings as homosexual, heterosexual. This is an artificial construction, which is which is um, was only created about 120 years ago. Islam doesn't look at it like that. It, it, all Islam says is uh, that basically between uh, male and female reproductive families, uh, there are basically uh, there's institutional marriage. That's what it looks at. Uh, as to whether uh, two guys, and they could be two heterosexual guys, as you call it, heterosexuals. So we two heterosexual guys who want to raise a child, that can happen. Well, they, i.e., the two guys live in the same house. That can happen, and then one of them has a child. That can happen, and they both help each other. That happens already, and within the Arabic world, you know, as, as it says, it takes a whole village to raise a child. So everyone participates in raising a child. So we don't divide into heterosexual, homosexual. We just look at it as human beings, and in, in human beings, yeah, any people can raise a child, right? Why you need to discriminate by saying that's homosexual, that's heterosexual, based on just um, sexual proclivities? I think that's. That, that kind of political um, discrimination is part of the problem as opposed to giving us a part of a solution. Uh, you, sir? Um, you're talking about uh, the kind of preventative measures in, in Sharia um, for things like that. I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> you can just pretend it's worth seeing. <laughs> and it will uh, just really so yeah, so um, you know we shouldn't uh, a man shouldn't spend the night in uh, watching a movie with a woman because uh, they might end up having sex. But it seems to me like um, you know we don't ban cars just because some people get run over when they cross the road. Most people don't, in fact, get run over when they cross the road. Um, and, and that's an analogy for for this 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 idea that in uh, I suppose it seems to me like in Sharia law, it's a bit, the, the feeling is a bit like paranoia, like, you know, these tiny little incidents are going to happen in, in, you know, a tiny percentage of society, and therefore everyone is subject to this, uh, to this, this law, to this uh, prohibition of men hanging out with women, just so the tiny little percent can be, you know, can be controlled. Okay. And it seems a little bit... All right, well, um, tell that to all law systems that prohib prohibit anything, such as um, uh, prohibit drugs, prohibit drink driving. Not everyone that drink drives. In fact, most people that would have a bit of a drink and not go driving, most people don't have any accidents. Yeah? But there's a, a large proportion, a, a, a significant proportion that do have accidents. And they have big repercussions if they, if, if they do. And that's how they measure it. You know, um, most people that take drugs, uh, let's say cocaine or, or crack cocaine, they don't go out and start... Uh, you know, uh, killing or attacking people, or robbing people for their money, and, and so on and so forth. But it, call, it, it does cause that. There is a causal effect with those that do, and it is, it is significant. And that's why you have anything prohibited. Now, the only argument would be is to, well, what's, this, what's the percentage of, of uh, what's the likelihood of, of men and women uh, who are basically not married, and let's say they might, be they might be having boyfriends and girlfriends outside of that, but they're just hanging around. And, uh, you know, what's the percentage of those people that would do something if, if, if alone? Um, well, there's no, I don't think there's any surveys done, but what they have discovered is that when they, surveys on infidelity have shown that, depending on where you go and who you ask, or which surveys are done, they could, anywhere between uh, uh, 20, 30, sometimes even 40, 50 percent of married couples have, at least one of them has been in, in, uh, committed, cheated on the other person within their lifetime, 40, 50 percent in some cases. It's, that's an insane amount. You know, that would justify any ban if it was under, you know, drink driving or anything like that. I mean, I, I bet if cars uh, cause, you know, 50% um, of car journeys cause a death, they would ban cars. Or 40%, or even 30%, or even 20%, they would ban the cars. They'd find some other mode of transport. So, 
All I'm saying is that I'm not, you know, I'm not criticizing just for the sake of criticizing or so I'm, I'm just saying that, uh, you know, I was brought up in the West. I, I've seen, uh, I wasn't always a Muslim and I saw stuff and I, and I encountered stuff and, and a lot of us have seen this, the, these aspects, these problems occur. I'm not saying that some of the Muslim countries out there are, are any better either. Uh, a lot of them are westernized, a lot of them have the same problems. All I'm saying is human nature, you know, uh, sexual tension exists. Between, I'll guarantee that there are there is sexual tension between a lot of lot of the guys here and a lot of their female friends. Guaranteed. Not mean they're going to act on it. I'm not going to say they're going to rape each other or they're going to sleep each other. But there it exists. And women and guys feel uncomfortable when their girlfriend or their boyfriend hangs around with their friends who happen to be maybe more prettier, more handsome, or whatever. They feel uncomfortable and naturally uncomfortable. Why don't you go to them and say, mate, you're too paranoid. Or, you know, girl, you're too paranoid. He's, you know, sure, she might have, you know, a low-cut top and mini skirt, and she might be jokingly flirting with him and inviting him to, to a house all the time. But that's, you know, that's just, they're two adults. No, you'd feel uncomfortable if you heard that. If you're in that, you're in that situation, if you're a girl, you'd feel uncomfortable, naturally. So all this time is pointing out is human nature. That's all it really is. And as I said, uh, if you have a problem with human nature, well, I'll take it up with, the creator or evolution, but um, I didn't make the rules for humans. But this is what humans, this is how human beings act. Uh, the lady at the back. Sorry, I'll get two seconds. The lady at the back there. You kind of compare the consequences of drink drivers or consequences of something like infidelity. What happens when people get addicted to certain drugs and they go on rampages and they get addicted to certain drugs and they get hurt? People die. Whereas with infidelity, what's the worst that's going to happen is like what, somebody gets knocked up. In a rare case, some people um, get HIV or things like that. It's just, it's not on the same level. You can't compare it. It's apples and oranges. Okay. Firstly, I, I wasn't making a comparison. I was, I was issuing a, a principle. I was talking about a principle that uh, he said that uh, it doesn't happen, uh, uh, well, if, you, if, if, if cars can cause some injury to people sometimes, you know, why don't we ban cars? And I said that no, uh, you know, like uh, if cars had the same kind of uh, causality rate, uh, causality as uh, being alone with someone does uh, to causing infidelity, then they probably would. Uh, as, as a matter of principle, I wasn't making the comparison. I was just illustrating a principle that he brought up, actually, not myself. But what I will say is, uh, it's not the physical harm that's caused. You think, well, so does someone getting knocked up hurt? I mean, maybe childbirth hurts, but getting knocked up—that's not physical harm. Yeah, what hurts? What causes a pain? It's emotional pain. It's paranoia, that subsequent paranoia, damaged relationships. Women or men aren't able to trust anyone any, anymore after that. You know, some people are really committed to their partner and then get cheated on. It doesn't feel pleasant, right? It really, it, and some people who've experienced you know, regular heartbreak have trouble having, making any kind of relationships after that or any successful ones after that, or they don't trust subsequent partners. The psychological damage is horrific, and it's still in its human suffering. It doesn't have to be physical, it can be emotional. And emotional is even worse. I'd prefer to be, you know, maybe you know, slightly hit by you know, a car and suffer a few days in hospital with bruises and cuts, than I'd be cheated on. Oh, oh, infinitely more. You see, so this is the, 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 the human reality. Unless you, if you want humans to suffer, that's fine, then you know, enjoy it. But if you, if you want, actually want a, human beings to actually uh, respect each other and, and not uh, uh, hurt each other in that way, then some kind of uh, rules should be, you know, should be put in place to help human beings to, to do the right thing. Uh, this, is, this is all I'm saying. So that, that okay, I think, I don't know if you... Okay, that's a good, good question. Firstly, I didn't say women didn't have desires. In fact, I didn't even say who would initiate the, the uh, sexual approaches if a man or woman were alone together. I didn't, I didn't say who would initiate it. I just said that, you know, uh, with sexual tension, when two people are alone, it's late night, you've had something to drink, 
things might happen, it might happen, and it has, and we know situations, we all know situations uh, that, where it has happened, quite a few times in fact probably. So that's all I'm saying. Um, women certainly have desires, and that's why I, I mentioned in my, in my lecture that if uh, a woman finds her husband can't satisfy her sexually, they've tried everything, they've, you know, they've really tried, she can, she, she can get divorced. She, has, she can get divorced, she can uh, and ask for a divorce, and it will be given to her. In one case, a woman came up with the Prophet Muhammad said, I want to divorce my husband. And he goes, uh, why? Don't love him anymore. Okay. That was it. But I mean, Oh, this depends. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Carry on. Yeah, I've been talking about and the fact that you know, what, I mean, I really, I don't think everyone should feel on their body, but um, just because you have breasts, um, you know, it, and the same as other women. What about men? I mean, men have things that other men have, and they don't have to cover up, and they like to see it. You don't have to cover your beard because you've got a beard. You know what I mean? Well, I don't, I don't think the beard is uh, okay. The beard is is, 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 uh, is is a sexual attribute of a man. Um, but but there is there actually is modesty laws for men. But that you don't hear that much because uh, in fact a lot of uh, the way you see a lot of golf Arabs dress uh, that you wouldn't know there was modesty laws for men. But there is. Uh, so men can't show body shape uh, either, and they ha they have to cover up from uh, navel to the knee, and they can't they can't expose uh, expose themselves and so on. There is there is those laws for men. But it's just a matter of biology that uh, women have more attributes of sexual reproduction upon them. They're, they're, sorry. No, no, it's um, no, no, it's not okay. It's it's not okay. Of course, yeah. Um, at least I'm consistent, right? Anyway, no. All right. Okay, basically, it's, it's just to do with um, attraction. So, um, uh, basically, I think this is obvious. Uh, women are certainly more aesthetically uh, aesthetic than men are, uh, and so this is perhaps the nature of the thing, the nature of uh, of uh, the kind of um, the, the the human species. So women are very attractive. They generally have they're more aesthetically shaped uh, than men, more pretty men, more beautiful, and so on and so forth uh, than, than guys are. And uh, just people who study you know study species, study, study animals, study and compare it to human beings, and they call it sexual dimorphism, with the difference between the looks of uh, of uh, of uh, men and women, uh, will conclude that basically women are designed to be attractive. Uh, to, to, to men, and men are, you know, in, in, in the human species will kind of court or, or try to pursue the women. So in this aspect, all, you know, any uh, anthropologist will tell you the same, same thing, basically, or any evolutionary um, psychologist will tell you the same thing, as I'm telling you. It's an obvious observation that human, uh, women are more attractive than men. And so um, modesty, they, they, they probably have to have a bit more modesty than men would require, but men also requ require modesty in Islam. And they can't just show their body shape, and they can't, you know, they can't come out of the gym and just show their muscles and like that. And I'm like, I'm just showing my muscles. And they're like, no, because that also is attractive. There is modesty laws for... Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it's called aura, which is basically the, uh, the parts of, of the men, male's body that can't be shown, uh, uh, including body shape. So that's the, that, but, but we don't we don't really hear much of that because the focus is always on what does how does Islam treat women how does Islam treat women so anyway that's uh, one of the aspects so you, you sir well, early on we start talking about how uh, the state doesn't tell you to do with your family no so, sir early on we start talking about how Islam doesn't tell the, the state doesn't tell you what to do with your family no, no the, the, the state won't spy on uh, on your household so there was sort of an, a sort of public private distinction. Yes. And then later on we saw that through Sharia that there really isn't that distinction. Not that that's wrong. Uh, well, well, there isn't a distinction. If you're telling you how to treat your wife, if you're telling you how to dress, so there really isn't that much of a distinction between private and public. Oh, okay. But my question, no, yes. my, question, my question is, the modern state is a European construction that does have the public and private distinction. So in regards to the Arab Springs and the new Islamic parties coming to power, how will Sharia accommodate itself to that ontology of private and public? Okay, um, the Sharia will talk about all aspects of human existence and, exp and experience, from what you do in your home privately, you know, toilet etiquette and all that stuff. It'll talk about, it'll talk about everything. But I'm talking when I meant uh, Sharia, and all this discussion when I talk about Sharia is uh, the legal, the law apply aspects of it. So that what state will enforce? State enforced Sharia. The state doesn't enforce all the Sharia. We we make we always make this we make this uh, assumption, or maybe um, people in the West when they see oh, but Islam is very totalitarian uh, because uh, the Sharia is so comprehensive, and the state, the Islamic state, must apply the Sharia. So then they put one and one together and come out with three. Really, 
uh, the state does not enforce all the Sharia law. And there's many times with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu for example, there was a time when uh, uh, him and, the, uh, and uh, some of the Sahabas, and, and they saw, I think it was a, a woman who was um, uh, kind of acting in an immodest aspect away, and one of the guys said, oh, you know, l let's go tell her that, you know, what, let's go tell her what for. And the Prophet Muhammad said, no, just leave her. So there is, you know, and like insulting people. So if you use bad language, you're not uh, on a kind of one-to-one -one level. So if you go into an argument, you just use, but you insulted someone, called them whatever. Uh, the state won't then start punishing you for insulting that person or what have you. But obviously, if you make a public insult in newspapers and things, then, well, in, in, in Western law as well, slander and libel laws are the same. So there is a, there is a public-private distinction. As in terms of the Arab Spring, um, well, the Arab Spring basically is, is not really an application of Sharia. It's rather that the, uh, the certain Western nations have noticed their puppets are unpopular. So what they did is that basically they facilitated a change of face, but under, still under their um, auspices. So the constitution, the Muslims will never get to decide the constitution, whether it's Sharia or not. Uh, they'll use the excuse that, uh, well, there's, you know, as long as it's one single Christian in your country, you can't have a Sharia state. Okay, but in the West, which is liberal, right? Not everyone is liberal in, in, in England. There are people who are not liberal, people who are communist, people who are fascist. You don't say, no, no, we can't apply liberalism because there's a few people that disagree with it in your country. No, they'll say, no, we're going to apply it. And if you, you know, you guys don't, don't like it tough, right? But in Muslims, we don't get that uh, um, luxury. You say, oh, no, uh, there are Christians in your country. You can't apply Sharia because, you know, they, they wouldn't agree with it. Even though we wouldn't even enforce it on Christians. Uh, you know, Christians and Jews, uh, they're not under the Sharia law because they don't believe in it. We don't believe in applying law. Uh, on people who don't believe in it. We don't actually believe in one law for all because it's unfair to impose it on other people. Whereas in the West, they will impose their law. Uh, and and uh, you saw in Canada, for example, when Muslims wanted to apply for just, well, even law, it was arbitration courts for divorces and things like that, marriage and divorces, like, like the Jews had in, in Canada. And suddenly all these secularists came out of the woodwork, militant ones, and said, abolish it, you know, no arbitration courts, one law for all, the Canadian legal system would, would, would you know, solve all of it. And, the, and, and the, the poor Jews even had their own arbitration courts overturned as well. So um, Islam is more uh, uh, multicultural, more accepting than uh, secular uh, Western systems, but they will never allow the Sharia law to be applied in our countries uh, because uh, they have an ideological difference. You know, liberalism uh, is intolerant. It will never tolerate a rival ideology to itself. So uh, during the McCarthy eras in America, you know, we're America's liberal country, they didn't. How do they treat communists? You saw how they, tr they treat communists. Now communists are no longer a threat. They don't care. Now, now communists are just a bit of a joke now. But they won't tolerate Muslims who believe in Sharia because that runs against the, the, the political philosophy underpinning liberalism, which is the individual even though they can't justify it rationally. They just say, these truths we hold to be self-evident. Where is it? But no, where is the evidence? You, you said, that's just dogma. You're just saying, I must accept it now because you said it. I want proof. I want some argument. I want some justification. But they don't have any, they don't have any justification. So this is one of the, the issues. I suppose it's a, a long couple of times. I'll get back to you one second. I just want to get to some other, 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 uh, that gentleman over there. Um, so you briefly mentioned um, how for needs there's no interest um, in the economic sphere. Um, so does that mean that there will be no, it will be a fixed rate for things such as food and clothes and such to make it sustainable? Is that, is that the sort of suggestion? No. Um, basically, generally speaking, the summary economic system is less fair. However, uh, there is no interest, but there is. They can, there, there are loans based on, for example, re religiously motivated loans like waqaf or trusts. Uh, so, uh, in Islam, we believe that lending money uh, is a charity, even though you'll, you'll get it back. It's actually a charity. A charity. What I mean is, is sorry, what I mean by a charity, you'll get rewarded by God for doing so. And so we had in the, uh, our hospitals, most, many, many hospitals within the medieval Islamic world, universities were set up purely on waqaf or trusts. And even in, in the West, they have trusts as well. They still have the trust, the trust system. Um, but generally speaking, you can't, since you can't, you can either do that or you can engage in invest, investment. So basically, I can approach a rich guy and say, you give me some money, I will, give, I will put my work, I'll, I'll work with your money in X, Y, and Z market, and I will give you a percentage of the, of the profit or the loss. So they share the profit and the loss. That's how the business was conducted. But there's many, there's many actual types of, of a company sys structure, but that was one example which, which is, was, was used. Um, in terms of, um, uh, what was, oh yes, uh, 
public resources like water or now oil and gas can't be privatized but it's not owned by the state either it belongs to the people so in essence to extract uh, the people only paid uh, only have to pay money to extract those resources at cost price and deliver it to them uh, maybe to improve it as well obviously and so on but they're not, to, uh, they're not basically uh, kind of taken advantage of like how BP and other oil companies, in my opinion, takes advantage of all of us by they're making record profits. But in this time of austerity, they're raising prices. What's that about? See, that's exploitation of the poor people. And so that's, what, that's how Islam would deal with those issues. I mean, there's some economics are quite detailed and, I'm, and, I, and I've horrendously just you know, been very brief with it. But... Um, it, that's, it has many structures like that which would basically work to generate uh, a, a vibrant e economy. But doesn't that mean that power is invested in the extractors then? So would that mean that potentially you could have um, a cooperation of these extractor resources, so farmers, um, uh, miners, etc., etc., um, like a cooperation for them to gain, like, Political power. I know it's green, but you know, as you oh, said, I you um, have them, you know, just why you get rid of the temptation altogether. Mm -hmm. Um, no, no, because it would be supervised by the, the state, basically. So the, the state would, would um, the state represents uh, the interest of, uh, okay, represents the, pe the, the people in Islam. So basically the state, uh, the, the Muslims select a Khalifa from amongst themselves, uh, and they would select this Khalifa, and this Khalifa would then discharge Islamic obligations on behalf of the people. Because as, as, an, as a baker or a, or a shoemaker, I, I don't know what's happening in the world. I, I can't, you know, as a one individual, I can't do everything. But uh, a collective activity obviously is needed, so state is, uh, as an institution is required, and that is selected by um, the people, and then the state will then discharge all these Islamic obligations, including the extraction and distribution of resources uh, to, and, and giving it to the people. Uh, a side point, I didn't mention this, but I should make it clear, uh, that people who were too poor to pay for that, or too poor to pay taxes, uh, they didn't have to pay taxes, so even if uh, there was a case where an, a Christian, an old Christian man, when it came up to Caliph Omar when he was a Caliph, and he, was, he just knocked on his door with, uh, with his begging bowl. And the Caliph said to him, like, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, like, you know, what are you doing? So oh, I'm begging, I'm, you know, I don't have any money, I'm, t I'm hungry. And Caliph Omar was, um, was uh, sickened and horrified, not with the guy, with, like, what's gone wrong that you know you in your youth who was a citizen of our state is now reduced to poverty and he took him to the uh, Beit al-Mal which is the treasury and you know gave him uh, as much money as he needed to, to live survive and so on and so forth and he was probably uh, some kind of social welfare I suppose and this was in this was obviously at the inception of Islam so we're talking you know uh, seventh century uh, social welfare in the seventh century uh, where I, there were very few systems I don't think of any system that springs to mind where there was automatic social welfare for the poor in most of these countries beyond just charitable trusts done by religious institutions which, which happened before uh, Keynesian economics took over. So uh, Islam cares for the poor whether it's Muslim and non-Muslim and that was one example uh, and so on but anyway the economic system is quite detailed so perhaps uh, we should uh, discuss that uh, I suppose further or maybe if these guys want to uh, invite me for another lecture I can just, just discuss the Islamic economics and then we can focus on that. Uh, that lady over there, uh, oh is it, oh Oh, right, right at the end, sorry. I'll get to you in a second, sorry. I just want to know your response with what's going on on the ground nowadays. Like, uh, what do you think of the Sharia law and the international law and how we can resolve this kind of conflict between both of them? Like, for instance, in the Islamic law or Sharia law and what's actually in the law of the Islamic countries is homosexuality is against law. But in the international law, this is something should not be punished for. So I just want to know, is there a kind of formula where we can harmonize both, I don't know, like international law and Sharia law, or should we keep on deserving on such, you know, victories, international victories and so on? Sure. Well, um, firstly, uh, okay, if, if an Islamic state was to exist or was to come about, uh, which of which there are no Islamic states at the moment uh, in the Muslim world, you, um, that's a long story. Um, then, uh, uh, sorry, but the Sharia law is the source of all the laws in, in, the, in the Islamic country? No, I think you'll find it's, mo I mean, it's, it's mostly um, uh, 19th century Renaissance laws like uh, the French Napoleonic Code in a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, law in Egypt and uh, Syria. And what they did is they just said that oh, it's, it's, Islam is the religion of this country and Sharia is a source of law, not the source of law. Interesting that distinction. 
uh, and Iraq as well, many of such, such countries. And then they just they, they did that to, to placate the, the religious conservatives, and then they just they brought a lot of uh, secular law systems into these countries, which have now caused factionalism, caused infighting, um, corruption is still continuing. A uh, small amount of uh, corporation uh, owners own vast resources of these countries, and there's still lots of poor people. And so there is, you can clearly see no Sharia being applied. And uh, as a token gesture, they might apply some punishment systems as a token gesture, and they misapply on the wrong people. So in, in, in Saudi, you get poor people being punished for theft. Poor people. You can't punish poor people for theft. But it, it can happen. Or in Iran, for example, where they have, um, again, they, 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 they do the same thing, although not necessarily with amputation. So uh, there, are, there is no Muslim country in the world today which uh, is an exemplar, exemplar of, of Sharia. We're more post-colonial states. You know, uh, you have to understand what colonialism did to the Muslim countries. Well, there was oh, well, there, there was the historic caliphates. I mean, there's only one kind of Islamic state, there, and this is a caliphate, basically. Um, and uh, what the, what the colonialists did was, when they came to a Muslim country, they would basically divest the religious schools of any power. Uh, they would claim that people are illiterate if they don't speak English or French or what have you. And so, on to be literate, you have to uh, join the education system of of, uh, of which is supplied by France, like what happened in Algeria with the, under French colonialism, uh, which happened in Egypt uh, under Britain. And, and India, a lot. India was a very big case. So under these kind of systems, um, people kind of the Muslims would became detached from understanding their own legal theory. And what you get today is almost like a childlike understanding of of the Sharia, not very nuanced or complex understanding of the Sharia. All you have to do is take example of the Taliban, take example of the Taliban or of uh, Saudi or of Iran, and just compare it to the historic Caliphate, Baghdad, Andalus, Al Andalus, the uh, Iberian Peninsula. Compare the Islamic systems. Just compare it. You'll see the difference. You'll see that we were more enlightened in the past than we are now. And that, there's, a, there's a whole reason for that. Uh, a, a, a very long sociological discussion as to why this came about. But um, I think we need, to, we need to discover what Sharia is first and discover actually thinking as well. We have to, we have to revive our, our, our intellectual thought and discussion. Uh, and uh, uh, basically determine our own kind of future uh, away from control by uh, foreign powers who tell us which, di which people to elect, which not to elect, wh which constitution, which, what, what, what is, which faction uh, shouldn't be involved. Like look at Syria recently. You know how America is trying to um, formalize the opposition? It's so, like we want, to, you know, we don't know who to, who to work with but they, they invite certain groups that they like and they keep other groups they don't like which is i.e. Um, you know general Islamic groups or what have you and they call them jihadists and so on and so forth. And then, they, and then their, their approved group becomes the group that they deal with, they'll give money to, they'll give weapons to. And then in Syria, that group, which, is, which would be under America's auspices, will then have more success in the battlefield because they have better weapons, better, better technology and so on and so forth. And then of course, the next government in Syria will be uh, pro-American. And American will just tell the government that if you don't do what we say, we can, e we can easily fund another, another faction within your country who will depose you. So either it's you or someone else, you know, pick, pick, and they'll pick themselves. And that's how they've done it throughout. They've done it in Latin America as well. Not just the Muslim, but they to Latin America as well. So this is how it operates. It's what they call neocolonialism. So we have to free ourselves first before we can actually uh, determine our own, our own future. And as I said, as for Afghanistan, that's been attacked by so many powers. I mean, like, this is the fourth time in England's invaded Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan, Afghanistan has had constant warfare there is no, there is no, there could be no more civility anymore, unfortunately, uh, uh, within the people. I think that's a horrible shame. I think they should be civilized. They should try it. But they've been under so many attacks from people. They, it's, it's caused a constant warfare situation. It is anarchy. It's almost, it is barbaric now. Uh, but they've been made to be barbaric, and that's unfortunate. And I, I wish, I wish they weren't, and I wish things were different. But you know, that's the situation. Sorry, I've, uh, I've gone on. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one uh, is that if you're blind, women should cover up from head to toe. Aren't you blind that if you're not covering up, should be viewed as a sexual object? I mean, um, if a man looks at a woman at a, as a sexual object just because she's wearing regular clothes, I think uh, something's wrong with him. And my second question is about the capital punishment. Um, what if a person is found to be innocent afterwards? Because this can happen. Okay. 
Um, oh, the, the capital punishment. Okay, what if a person's found innocent after capital punishment? Well, in Islam, the Prophet Muhammad said uh, that it is better uh, that ten guilty people go free than one innocent person is punished. And so he said that ward, he said ward the way the, 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 the capital punishments by ambiguities. So if you can find any ambiguity, anyone, no matter how small, uh, then prevent the punishment. Then, then uh, um, throw the case out of court. So throw the case out of court. So the Prophet Muhammad tried to find any way to get out of applying the capital punishment, including when people come up to him and admit to him, he turned his head away. He, he turned his head away and the people had to kept, kept, on, kept on at him. He said, like, no, no, are you insane? You know, he actually asked him, is, is there something wrong with you for you to keep insisting that you're, you're, you're guilty and I should punish you? Um, so he tried every way possible not to apply the law because the law, or the, the, the capital punishment laws are designed for prevention. They're not designed for actual implementation. If I was going to design a law that would catch every single adulterer, I could do much better. I could make a new law that would catch every single adulterer. But to say four witnesses in public and you must see everything, that's so impractical. The only, the only, the only uh, wisdom behind it would be just the symbolic effect that it exists. That's all. And so um, it, I would doubt anyone uh, would get caught uh, unless you, you know, want to provide half-time entertainment at a football match. But um, as for the issue about sexual objectification of women, I didn't say that the Sharia says that any woman that is not covered is a sexual object. I said that uh, in this society, uh, women are portrayed as sexual objects that feminists have criticized um, advertisements for magazines for. Uh, they even have, you know, those, those shirts that have, uh, uh, and um, what's it called? I know it's hot pants, whatever, with, with kind of suggestive wording on it. So on the butt and on the chest. Like, why there? And these kind of particular wordings, which, you know, I won't, I won't iterate in polite company. This is blatantly sexualizing the woman. It's blatant. It's not even an issue of dispute, or maybe you've, you've interpreted it that way. No, they're sexualizing women because it sells. It sells money. It's capitalist. It sells. You can use women to sell cars. You can use women to sell phones. You can use women to sell all kinds of products. And so, you know, things that are not even related to just, you know, wearing... Um, uh, low cut tops and mini skirts, but they would employ that for, for anything as, as mundane as washing up liquid or whatever. Yeah, but because it, it sells. So, you know, to women it shows that, you know, if you buy this product, you're as glamorous as, uh, as, as sexually attractive as that girl. And to guys, it's probably suggesting that you can uh, have that girl if you, if you just take that links or whatever, <laughs> you know, that uh, aerosol. That's what sexualizes and objectifies women. I'm not sure doesn't say it. It's what I'm observing from society. And all I'm saying is that what the Sharia is doing is that it's trying to prevent that exploitation and abuse of women whereby she can only be noticed in society if she looks attractive and looks sexy. Whereas in Islam we say it is sufficient that she is a human being to deserve respect and attention and not that she has, she's just a pair of legs or a pair of, uh, of backsides or breasts or so on and so forth. That's what Islam is saying. Okay, how many questions? One more last question. Oh, no, okay. Woman from yeah, by the yeah. back. Um, I just like your um, point that you need to have um, four witnesses for um, Muslims to be considered sexual objects. Yeah. Um, and I think that you need to have four witnesses for mixed gender witnesses or for male witnesses. Okay. Um, and, okay, in terms of, I, I know you're alluding to, in terms of wit, uh, witnesses, uh, male, men and women are generally equal in terms of witnesses. So, for example, if a, a husband accuses his wife of adultery or vice versa, uh, it is sufficient for the wife to say that I didn't do it, and that annuls, so they, they cancel each other out. So if the husband says, my wife committed adultery, and she says, no, I didn't, then that, that considers to be can, you know, uh, cancelled out. So they are basically, if the husband's testimony was, was greater, then it wouldn't be considered to be cancelled out. But, but it showed that they are equal. The only aspect, the only aspect where there is, um, actually there is no aspect requiring that there must be two witnesses, there was only what you might call a, a positive discrimination, as liberals would call it, whereby uh, women on, were not uh, uh, um, uh, privy to a lot of economic transactions at, at the time. Men always, at, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, did economic transactions. So all that was done uh, to kind of uh, uh, actually even support women to actually be involved in financial transactions is that uh, you know, when the transaction, when the agreement is being made, uh, then you, know, you have two, uh, two women witnesses because she might not be familiar with it. Uh, so just have two women witnesses. But when uh, at a later date, if the witnesses are called to give testimony, only about, and it's only about financial transactions, by the way, it didn't say anything else about murder or rape. Let's talk about that. Just talk about financial transactions. 
um, then the woman is sufficient to give her testimony. The Quran says, but uh, if she makes a mistake, then her friend will correct her. If she makes a mistake. But if she doesn't make a mistake, her friend won't correct her. So then it's just her witness is enough. You see? It was positive discrimination, as, as liberals would call it, rather than actually saying, no, 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 you need two women, otherwise I won't, uh, only counts as one man, otherwise I won't take it. So that's what the Quran says. It doesn't say that you must produce two female witnesses and then we'll accept it. Others said that, said that uh, you know, bring two witnesses to witness the contracts at a later date, basically. If one woman makes a mistake, if she makes a mistake, then the second one will correct her. We're implying that the second one can be silent because the first one, if it wouldn't make a mistake, wouldn't need to be corrected. I didn't say she needs to have male witnesses. I didn't well, say. Oh no, no, no! She didn't have, have male witnesses. There was a, a hadith by um, of the Prophet Muhammad uh, whereby uh, a woman was raped and basically uh, she came, ran to the Prophet Muhammad and there was no one around that saw it, just her and she said, I've been raped and uh, the Prophet Muhammad said, alright, show me the guy and they, 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 they grabbed the guy and uh, actually apparently that guy was the wrong guy because she, she didn't see him properly but then the real guy admitted that, yeah, I committed the rape and he was punished so, um, but the, the moral of that story was that one woman's testimony was enough to, to initiate a rape, a rape prosecution so uh, that's not there. Again, that verse is only related to about the two women uh, witnesses, only related to financial transactions, and it's not actually uh, even that you need two of them, just one of the backup, if, if the first one makes a mistake. Yes, uh, thank you, Abdullah. Thank you, everyone, to, uh, for your attendance. Uh, uh, and finally, uh, as we promised you, it's time for dinner, pizza, and I uh, hope everyone is actually uh, get this. Uh, uh, very, very correctly, and you know too much uh, mis misunderstood about Sharia. Ah. And uh, for this, uh, 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 for this point, well, we ask you, request you to, to come from this door for exit. We have some leaflets and different uh, topics about Islam, so you can uh, just have uh, more knowledge about it. And thank you very much again.